me, I'm always interested in the psychological aspect of just people's way of being. So it's that thing about how powerful your mind is. The best short films for lifelong learning recommended by teachers for teachers. This is Short Films Teachers Love with your host, Richard Lee. I worked as a professional filmmaker for about 10 years. Mm-hmm. And you know, some some of it was self-funded, some funded by a film funding body. And then I ended up on a committee after Black Saturday bushfires because they wanted to engage some young people in Marysville. And they set up, I think it was Film Vic and somebody else set up a big screen project, and they wanted local community to contribute. So I was there, sort of as a sort of youth advisor, and I suggested that they possibly get young people who were interested to do some animations. And I, there was a local person who was a filmmaker and an animator, so I didn't do that work. But that's how it started for me. And then um, I, a series of workshops became what I now run, which is a project called the Rural Animation Project. So you, you weren't the animator technically for that, but you got involved with that. Um, so how did that emerge that you were then involved in this, this Rural Animation Project? From that point, I actually recognised the benefits of the sort of incidental learning that happens when you show some films, talk about them, get young people who may be a bit unconnected at school, just don't actually identify with the structured environment. But there's, there's lots of incidental learning in that whole process. What makes a good story? What are their responses to a good story? How you actually make one? All the programs I use, which are Photoshop, you know, the graphics program and Premiere, they're all diagram based. So for kids who have literacy challenges, they can actually create without being able to read and write. And so I've taught quite a few groups that of newly arrived kids from overseas in regional communities, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, kids who come in their teens and have never been to school but they can do it on the first day because it's a diagram-based program and it's fun. Yeah, yeah. I want to just for a moment jump back to this this one called Slim Pickings. So he's faced with this dilemma. If he goes down one path, he loses his best friend. If he goes down another path, he's still starving. So it's classic dramatic tension. You know, that's the thing you want in a perfect narrative plot. You know, Anthony Lucas, the director, is very clever. But it's simple. And so it's completely accessible. And then there's all the sort of secondary dialogue that you can have around that. And when you... Like I work with a lot of adolescents and so when you want to talk about things, you know, to be able to talk about it in the second person because you're referencing this narrative that they're watching so it's not about them and then uh, we talk about things like, okay, so here's this guy, he is desperate. Now, what does it mean for him? Do you think if he just waited for a minute before he made that quick decision would his life be different? They go, yeah, man, he should have waited. He should have waited. <laughs> so all that dialogue about being impulsive or not, you know, can you just wait a minute because, man, the stakes are really high. Mm. In 2011, you ended up with the Shepparton English Language Centre. Um, now, Shepparton, for those who are listening, you know, for example, overseas, it's a major rural country town in what we call the fruit bowl of Victorian farming country. So there's lots of canning and packaging and fruit and veg from the surrounding areas. It also has a high proportion of refugees and asylum seekers. And I understand that out of this came... Uh, an animated series or at least one animation called A Family of Weddings and it was the winner of the best middle school animation for the Australian Teachers of Media Awards in 2012. So that's an achievement. Fantastic. Congratulations. Um, Tell me a little bit about that and and how you sort of, how your career has steered a little bit more into this direction of working with, you know, refugees and asylum seekers. I think because I 
started to recognise the benefits of it as a mental health tool, I then approached Berry Street. What was really challenging but also a good fit in terms of the process is that almost all of these teenagers had never been to school. So the English Language Centre has to do all of primary school and half of high school to prepare these kids for middle high school within 12 months, Wow! sometimes six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, massive. And, you know, their thirst for knowledge is phenomenal. So they are sensational. Great students. Oh, man. Because they just, I mean, they've had nothing. You know, some of these girls have literally lived in a cupboard, but the boys too. Like, they're all wonderful and they recognise the opportunity. So um, that particular story was told by an inter- by the interpreter, one of the interpreters in that group. Mm. Many of us have come for 100 years or more. Past the mountains, past the Green Valley, past the countries, past the big oceans, past the dangers, past the struggles. Multicultural Arts Victoria wanted animation that would foster some empathy, you know, to really get a sense of what these young people had been through. And so uh, they actually devised the script themselves, but I basically facilitated the discussion. And so often, as with other films, you film lots and you write lots and then you pick the bits that you think best encapsulate those essential elements to what it feels like to be a newly arrived refugee. So then they filmed themselves. A lot of that filming was just done on the oval next door to the school. One of the beauties of rotoscope animation, you don't have to worry about set yes. because all you're doing is tracing footage and then it was edited together. Mm. So you're almost, uh, I mean, you're really a documentary filmmaker yourself, aren't you? I mean, this is, this is a documentary process. You are yeah. documenting these lives, taking the interviews that people have given, finding the bits where there's, there's a narrative arc, structuring it so that it's going to be something that's engaging to watch. But the latest one is a narrative that they wrote uh, with, which, and it's absolutely, it's based on true, but it's fiction. So, you know, it just depends on what comes up, really. Yeah. So is this latest one, is that the two brothers, one girl and one chook? Yeah, that's right. Right. Now, where and when can we see this? Because I did read about that. Yes. Well, uh, I'm hoping by mid-year we'll be finished. The film is about six minutes long, a bit more. So that means, you know, at least 700 drawings a minute. So it's just not necessarily quick. For lots of the students who started, you know, they'll have a go at Photoshop and they go, oh, man, you've got to do more than two drawings. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's other kids who go, you know, can I have 300 more? So it's really about personal style, you know, what you enjoy doing. A lot of Kath's educational work involves running professional development for teachers. This got us onto talking about her final recommendation, Pixar's For the Birds. characters are sweet but it's quite powerful the relationship displayed on screen you know this sort of grumpy group of small birds and a great big sort of naive one so it touches on all the obvious exclusivity all this you know sort of bullying but it's really palatable because it's so fun whereas if you teach you try and teach a young person about that and you just constantly hammering them with very real drama they just sort of go oh man you know, it's just way too confronting, so they just shut down internally, even if they're not saying anything. The wonderful thing about some of the Pixar films is that there's no dialogue. It's all sound. So for a person who has never spoken English and doesn't understand a word, I remember sitting in a classroom and one of the teachers who I'd worked with quite a few years, she had a student who has, had really struggled and she'd been there for three months and she said to me, that is the first time I have seen her smile spontaneously at something we've done in class. Wow. So that's pretty messy. Yeah, fantastic. Tell me about some of your other varied work that you've done over the years. For me, the I'm always interested in the psychological aspect of 
uh, just people's way of being. Say your fam, say everybody in your family is 200 kilos and you're you weigh 50, and all everyone in your family has struggles with you know heart disease or something. If you believe you're going to have heart disease, even though you're a whippet, you're going to get you have a 30% chance of having the same condition. So it's that thing about how powerful your mind is to how what the impact has on your body, and so that's what Marty's party is about. To listen to the full conversation, join us on SoundCloud, iTunes or Stitcher. For extra notes and community support, join our Facebook group today. This show is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. To learn more, visit edupodcastnetwork.com.